Welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kyria Yvonne Traber, curator in residence with High Arts. Um, I am a femme woman with light brown skin, big hoop earrings, um, a golden yellow top. Uh, I'm sitting on a pink chair and there are plants on the wall behind me on shelves. We are grateful to have ASL interpretation today by uh, Brandon Kazen Maddox. And High Arts is a leading organization within the urban arts movement. For 20 years, High Arts has consistently broken new ground, advancing urban art by empowering artists to develop bold new works while creating a lasting and positive impact on urban communities. Our work is focused on serving as an incubation, development, and production space for new and innovative works facilitating educational programs and opportunities that increase access and diversity in the arts and working through the arts and across sector sectors to address key issues impacting our communities. And today we're happy to be talking more about Skylab, our newest residency, a virtual residency, a program for artists who are interested in developing work beyond the four walls of a traditional studio or theater space. As an incubation and innovation space, Skylab allows artists with a community engaged practice rooted in performance to take their ideas to the next stage through a remote development process. And we have with us our inaugural Skylab artist in residence, Ebony Noel Golden. Ebony is an artist, scholar, and cultural strate culture strategist from Houston, Texas, and currently based in Harlem. She devises site-specific ceremonies, live art installations, creative collaborations, and arts experiments that explore and radically imagine viable strategies for collective Black liberation. Welcome, Ebony. I'm so glad and I'm here. So glad you're here. And I'm hoping that you can sort of kick us off by sharing a little bit about this work you've been developing in Skylab in the name of. I sure will. I'm actually going to lead with art. Um, so this piece is a very fresh new piece that is written in, um, in this moment. I'm thinking a lot about how water, how we are water and what it means to be a walking river, a walking ocean and the work that is uh, really hydrating in the name of, asks us to consider the power and possibility of that. And so this piece is called Water, a Litany in Process. Water on water on water we rise, water as oracle, as water we thrive. Hydrate, ceremony, build an ocean inside. We are necessary. We are necessary. Drinking this water prize. Relics we gather black and flowing free. Black water is the ritual we are water we be. The marine prophets told us deserts were ocean floors. Now is time. It's reckoning time. Time to remember water divine. And then the liberation. And then the flying free. And then our gills grow gilded in this water society. Give it back to the water, give it back to the sea, give it back to the mama from oceans we be. Give it back like you owe her, give it back like you know, give it back like you water and join this holy flow. Come clean, see everything, this skin, archive, artifactual, telling our mythography. And how do we spell mythography? Between long sips of sunshine. First letter, 
fugitive. Second letter, drum. Third letter, we are the beginning. Fourth letter, run. Fifth letter, swim child. Sixth letter, go. Seventh letter, dive deeper now. Eighth letter, those who know, glow. Ninth letter, hide in the coral. Tenth letter, glisten sharp in the deep. Eleventh letter, find water breath. Twelfth letter, only surface in the crook of the creek. Thirteenth letter, remember the moon days. Fourteenth letter, become a prayer. Fifteenth letter, let it all go. Sixteenth letter, remember your stare is a scare. Seventeenth letter, fireworks, fireworks, fireworks. Eighteenth letter, quilt your rebirth in the waves. Nineteenth letter, there ain't no such thing as a secret. Twentieth letter, every lie is in the grave. Before you got here, you were already born. 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 You were already born. Come from the water, say we come from the water. You come from the water without water, you mourn. To the water, we will return to the source to the sky ocean, to the sky rise, to the ocean rise, to the sky rise, to the sky ocean, to the ocean rise. And who will believe these prophets who bring root wisdom in disguise? Give it back to the water, y'all. Give it back to the sea. Give it back to the mama from ocean we be. Give it back like you owe her. Give it back because you know. Give it back like you water and join this holy flow. I want to ask that everybody just take a breath with me and inhale and exhale. I like to lift up the organizations who are watering in the name of in this moment. My sister collaborator, Sister Dr. Alexis Pauline Gums, whose creative, scholarly, and spiritual work centers and grounds almost everything that I do. Without her writing, in the name of would not exist. I like to lift up Spirit House, a cultural organizing collective rooted in Durham, North Carolina, that received the blessing of Amiri Baraka's Spirit House in New Jersey and Newark, that provides my political, cultural, and spiritual home base in Durham, North Carolina. I lift up the legacy of the Apollo Theater, who has graciously committed to commissioning in the name of as a world premiere in its 2021 season. I like to lift up the practice and the legacy of high arts for being a beacon and a light and a leader in the creation of new works here in Harlem also. I like to lift up the life and the legacy of Toshi Regan who has committed to serving as creative advisor for the production of this work. I like to lift up my residential development partner, Double Edge Theater in rural Western Massachusetts and all of my family there working through a radical spiritual and cultural Jewish lens to bring new works to the world in public spaces, on farms, in lakes, in streams, in Western Massachusetts and beyond. And Stacy Klein, who is my mentor and the founder of Double Edge Theater. 
I would also like to lift up the network of ensemble theaters who's providing development money for this work. And in the midst of all of those people, there are many, many more organizations and folks and legacies and lineages that make it possible for me to work, um, for us to work. And in this moment, I love to just put Ashe and life and water on Dragonfly and Kristen, who've taken time out of their full creative and organizing lives to be in conversation about this process. Um, all light and love and deep nourishing waters to us. Ashe, thank you for all of that. And let me uh, bring a little more light to these two guests that you just mentioned. So we have with us also two of the makers who have been part of this Skylab devising process with you. Uh, we have Dragonfly. Um, and Dragonfly is Robin Laverne Wilson is Miss Justice Jester, conceptual artist, performer, storyteller, ritualist, writer, facilitator, educator, circle keeper, curator, cultural warrior, tambourinist, dean of details, activist, photographer, filmmaker, scholar, minister, ecologist, accidental senatorial candidate, Texan, New Yorker, uh, Mafa descendant, nerd, queer, eclectic, eccentric, curious, lover of all people and pronouns. Welcome Dragonfly. And new cat mom. And new cat mom. <laughs> Thank you. And we have Kristen Adele, um, who is currently hailing uh, from, or is perhaps originally from um, uh, Dallas, Texas, and is currently in Aquagana. We'll find out more. Um, and about Kristen, the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. These words from Tony Cade Bambara guide Kristen Adele Calhoun's work as a playwright, performer, and organizer. She's the founding program director of Art Change US and co-producer of Innerfest, an intersectional arts and ideas festival that began at the Harlem School of the Arts and many other things, as is everyone else. So welcome, Kristen. Could we do our accessibility introduction? Because I have just forgot. Absolutely. Do OK. I'm yes. Ebony Hall. Um, I'm, I am a dark brown woman. I'm wearing a black and white uh, femme woman. I'm wearing a black and white head wrap, big blue leather earrings that are in a circle, um, a red necklace, and a white blouse, and pink lip gloss. I'll pass it to Dragonfly. Hello, everyone. I am Dragonfly. I am a caramel skin, femme black woman. Uh, my hair is natural. I'm wearing uh, glasses inspired by the artist Maldrion. I'm wearing red earrings that look like Afro picks or mistaken for forks in Scotland, <laughs> procured in Kenya. I have a leopard print scarf tied around my neck. I have a pin stuck in my hair because I'm a nerd and a geek. And I would describe my aesthetic as Afropunk sexy librarian. Passing it to Kristen. All right, all right. I'm <laughs> Kristen. I am sitting here in a black chair. Behind me, there is a piece of art on the wall that has four ancestors walking toward the camera. There's a dresser to my right. It has a stack of books, including Emergent Strategy, Half of the Yellow Sun, Asada, Working Cures. On top of it is a bouquet of yellow flowers, or I'm sorry, pink flowers that I just got out of the garden. They were yellow before, but another pink. Um, I'm wearing a yellow dress. I have braids, I have brown skin, and I have silver and white beaded earrings hanging down in purple lipstick and a light glaze of sweat on my face because I am indeed in a cry Ghana. And it's, you know, it's warm here all the time. It's beautiful. You better come through with the intentional aesthetic curation, my friends. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so we just um, received so much from Ebony, some incredible poetry that um, 
was making me feel both thirsty and um, nourished with water at the same time. Um, and a, a list of some institutional supportive names. And then I just brought you two in the room because you have actually were a part of the devising process in this um, Skylab process. Mm -hmm. Ebony, I know that there are many more even. There are more um, makers that have been a part of the devising as well. And I'm curious about that part. If you could speak to who you chose to be in the devising lab with you and what led to those choices. Yeah, so here's the thing. You know, when initially I was in conversation with High Arts, I had a huge ask already and the ask was you know when you have a commission you still have to make the work and i live in harlem um my work is about harlem in large part right now um and in and communities that are adjacent to harlem and i need to rehearse in harlem i need to be able to get to harlem sites and locations very easily and so i thought to myself who could i go back to and or who could i go to and it was, I mean, it took me literally a millisecond to say, well, let me just call High Arts. And that was, is because the last ambitious work that I created started with the leadership at High Arts saying, what you doing, girl? We want, let's see what we can do and to help you. And that is such a, a good calling in for me. Like, what are you doing? And let's see how we can help. And so I went humbly but with a bold ask and you know how it is when artists are like high institution that didn't curate me i didn't apply but i have a i have a project can we talk you know they can be like girl we got an application process and a curator in residence and you just want to jump steps and so i recognize that it would be the beginning of a conversation. I didn't expect for a pandemic to happen, a great breakthrough to start to come through that made it possible to say, okay, artist in Harlem, high arts ask, what do you need? And I just leaned in and said, well, I need these things. But did I know who was gonna be available? No, I didn't. I don't even, I'm not gonna even play myself like that and act like I knew all the answers. I just knew that during this time I needed to be in process, right? And that I had hired, um, retained a casting director. We were about to go into auditions. I was about to bring all of these people together, actually for two projects. And then all things stopped. So in that stop, I mean, because when I'm not making work, I'm a consultant. So I sat on the couch for two weeks, like I don't have no idea what's going to happen. But then when the email started trickling back in, the, all of the, the emails were like, okay, so what are you up to now that this is happening? And everything started, you know, the question started, High Arts gathered some artists together to talk. And I asked, and then I was heard. And I wanna, I wanna just speak to that. And I've spoken to this off, you know, the Zoom, but I wanna just speak to what it means for High Arts to be relevant, responsive, nimble, and have in, in its DNA, you know, some hip hop aesthetic about it, which is about being emergent and flexible. Not a lot of organizations could figure out what to do with theater when you can't go into a building. And so, you know, to, 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 to that end, once the organization said, we see that you have something to do here, this is what we can do to support you. The thing, the, the call to action came really, I mean, I would have been doing something, but the call to action that was from my artist community being like, we need to make art or, it's, or we're going to be in trouble here. And then from the arts organization saying, we need to do, we need, our mission doesn't stop just because we're in this rupture moment. Said to me, as a person who wants to be active, let's get active. I had to think outside of the box though, because the traditional process of casting and ensemble and 29 hour and 29 hour, when you're making a work that really negates 
that those systems and structures anyway, you got to have, you need to be thinking about another way to tell the story. And so I, I said, okay, casting director, I'll get back to you when we need to do that. But right now, who are the people that want to, that I want to build with wherever they are in the world, if they have a Wi-Fi signal, I want to build with them. I've been wanting to build with Kristen. I mean, we are in shared community, shared creative community. We've been, you know, to some similar retreats and spaces and um, Art Change US. I've, Kristen has brought me in, you know, to be a part of things there. So these are folks that are not, not most of the people who came to participate in this are family, either close family, like both Dragonfly and Kristen are from Texas. Big important to me, you know, big, big important. And, and so I asked my people, and we talked about this in the first conversation about the difference between a collaborator and a cousin, you know, or, or a sibling in the work. And that is, that's the same thing here, right? And we're siblings and cousins and family because we have similar politics or their politics push my politics, right? They, the, the work that they make on their own is absolutely fabulous. And I'm just like, what they doing? I want to, I want to know. And they could go, I mean, Kiria, and I can go on and on and on with this. Yeah. But the thing is, I call people who I respect, who are also deep readers and listeners, because we are doing this piece in building the story and the world based on Alexis's work, but it's not like a reading of her books. We're not doing that. Folks who are deep readers and can extrapolate and like see a thing based on that, very important. And I'll say one more thing and then I'm, I'll, I'll move back. One more thing about this piece is that I was able to actually build the ensemble to be like a jazz ensemble. Mm. Think about Sharon Bridgeforth's work, Dr. Omi Oshu and Joni L. Jones' work and the jazz aesthetic is that you don't just have all horns in the room. You don't just have all pianos. So I was able to build a jazz ensemble with people on performance, acting, with people on sonic vocals, with people on images and visual art, all in the room at the same time, which typically those folks come in at different phases and stages. But as a person who's working in you know, theatrical jazz, ceremonial jazz, you know, it is absolutely imperative that the choreographer and the composer and the, the digital design person and the dramaturg are in the room at the same time while the work is being built. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's a depth and a nuance and a bottom to the way that this work will continue to grow because of that integrity, that architecture that's at the core of it. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. For... I want to hear from Kristen and Dragonfly. <laughs> well, and I also just want to, for those who are watching this and aren't aware, we had a separate conversation with Dr. Alexis Pauline Gums, Ebony, and myself, which talked a bit more about um, some of the things that Ebony just referenced and some of the theoretical underpinnings of this work and, a, and an approach to work more generally. You should definitely check that out. But speaking particularly about this and the jazz ensemble, I want to pass it over now to Dragonfly and Kristen. You can decide um, who wants to answer first, but I'm curious about what your role and roles might have been in this process and how that might have been different from what you would normally do in a in the room, in the studio, in person residency, this virtual process. Who would like to take that first? I'll jump in. I'll, yeah, I'll jump in. So Ebony, I love this description of a jazz ensemble. I know, you know, you used that description when we were in process too, and it it really feels accurate in the sense that when you called me, I didn't know what my role was going to be. I just knew you called, you know, and, I, and like I said earlier, when you call, I'm going to say yes. So I just showed up and brought all my tools, just brought the whole tool bag. It's like, what you need? And that would shift from day to day based on what we were conjuring that day. So when I think about role, I really think about 
it as a co-conjurer. It's like, okay, today you need me to like lean into my acting bag. Okay, I can do that. Do I need to lean into my writing bag? Okay, do you need me to zoom out and think about this from like a producing point of view? Like what, whatever the day requires. And, it, you know, it's really different than any other process I've been in because generally you're on a contract. Generally, I know when I come in, okay, I'm, I'm here as a writer. I'm here as an actor. But with this, it was like, I'm here to show up in the service of the work, in the service of whatever this is that spirit has called us all in to create. So it's, it's hard to pinpoint one specific role other than to say, we were all conjuring together. We were all around that cauldron looking in there like, okay, what else we need to put in there, tasting it? Like, okay, it needs a little bit more of this. But really, I mean, it's just such a beautiful process when we think about like non-hierarchical structures and how to like really work from this place of a, a black feminist lens that was constantly in practice in the ways that we were showing up. I'll pass it to you, Dragonfly. Oh, go ahead. All right, well, I did have a very specific role coming in. <laughs> um, Ebony called me and said, hey, I've got these two projects and I'm looking for a creative studio assistant. And talk about conjuring. Now, just to give a little personal context for me, um, I knew I was in creative, professional, personal transition, just like everybody during COVID, but specifically with my creative practice and transitioning from someone who is a strong collaborator to being at, uh, the genesis of my own work. But yet the irony is that being asked to be in this very specific supportive collaborative role has really like boosted my capacity as a solo artist. And I think that also speaks to uh, what Kristen was just saying about the fluidity of the role, even though my role was very specific. And I, I feel that being an admin in that sense is also an art form. Um, I talk about how I get, I get sexually aroused by spreadsheets and, and give me a good slide deck and I'm moist. Like to me, that is, that is art just as much. You know, there's the order and then there's the chaos. What'd you say? I'm a Cancerian. I'm very watery. I'm very watery. Okay, I, okay watery. I would have said earth sign though, all of that. I it's have no earth in my whole dang on chart. But it's experiences <laughs> like this that help ground me, truthfully. And in fact, this opportunity came at a time when um, I really needed, appreciated, and invited that structure. And, and it was, there was just as much of, of, of community building as there was creative collaboration. And there was just as much joy and play as there was focus and rigor. And that jazz aesthetic thing, I think even brought, it's just, it's just a black aesthetic. Period. We was just black. We just showed up black. And showing up black is like, is being fully authentic, fully present, you know, totally authentic and transparent about who you are and where you are in that moment. And I also realized that a huge benefit from this structure of the process, of course, is always give and take you lose when you're not there in person, but you gain something when you're able to take out the commute, that time that's lost, the hustle and bustle. If you're an empath, you picking up all that crazy subway energy. And instead you in your house, you in your element. And you can, you can, you know, still have the speaker going and, and still be creating while you go to the bathroom, get you a cup of tea, you, you, you know, whatever. And, and that I think really, really enhanced the creative process because it was that much more of us and our full selves being brought into the room and into the process. 
I'm really interested in that. What are, are there other things that were unique to this virtual process that might have unlocked surprising benefits? What, what else was um, creatively inspiring about meeting in this way, which m many, I, I'll just name for the audience, many folks think of this as restrictive, as shutting down possibility, as preventing us from doing what we what we know, what we've been doing. So enlighten us, help us get inspired, or or just speak for yourself, you know, what, what was different about this that was positive? One of our collaborators would always be outside on the back porch, and you know like i'm eating breakfast i cook this beautiful thing and i am on the back porch and this is what it is today or i'm at the kitchen table or i'm on the couch or i want to be in this room because i want this light like your home is maybe even thinking about it like your first performance space and to be able to think about the worlds that we are building inside of this work and do that from where you are building possibilities for yourself in your home, you know, in your room, on your porch, feels like a way in which to go back and forth in, in terms of like go into and out of a portal. And what, and uh, you know, that felt very comfortable, like very good to me. We're asking people to see Harlem as a space of possibility, as a, as a, a space where the neighborhood and June Jordan's sky rise architectural plan, mother plan, and all of these, you know, visions are on a, on a lived space. How do you do that on stage if you're not doing that at home? I mean, I think it's a deepening of a, of a performance pedagogy. Seems very relevant to me. Kristen, I see you want to get in there. Yeah, I, I mean, Ebony, I love that you brought up the mother plan because it felt like you mothered us really through the process. And because we were at home, we were able to really lean into that and have access to our things. I think about the day that you had us make altars with our things or the days, because I, I, that happened more than once. I think about the day that we checked in and we were tired, everybody needed rest. And you told us to go lay down, you know, and that being as important and as rigorous as anything else that we did as a part of the process and how, you know, that's not possible in the same way when we're in a rehearsal space to build an altar. You know, I could, I could go get the things out of my pocketbook or my backpack, but it's not the same as having the full access of my home things. So, and, and also just having access to, to food and, and care in a different way. Like I could eat when I needed to, I could turn off the video and just go to the bathroom. I didn't have to wait for a 10 minute break. And just being and cared for and thinking about how that really enriches all work, I think, in this work in particular, when we're thinking about how we mother, you know, what it looks like to, to provide the best possible care for everybody. In drawing in from our uh, previous conversation with, with Dr. Gums, we talked a lot about the homework um, in, in multiple senses of that word of making art with this black feminist and, and eco-feminist lens. And I'm struck with how um, it, 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 I mean, I'm sure you, this group would, would make do in all kinds of places and spaces, but I'm imagining what might be lost if you had to, as you said, like drop everything at home, bring what you can carry on the subway and go to a studio, which is for reasons that are entrenched in institution, sterile in, a, in many ways. And how different that is for the making and the sense of, um, you know, pulling from our literal environment as we um, conjure and evoke together. How much that just makes sense, you know, it, it, it's a different thing to pick up that sense of home and take it with you to the creative space as opposed to be rooted in it. That's really powerful. Um, I also, I'm wondering, Dragonfly, if you could speak a little bit more to what is a creative studio assistant and maybe what did you think it was and, and what did it end up, end up being? 
Well, that's a beautiful question. <laughs> well, let me tell you. You know, I'm gonna start this with a little anecdote. When I was about, I'm thinking, no more than seven or eight years old, because this is when I still a little girl in Detroit. My father had me sit down in front of a dictionary. He had me look up the word metaphysical and read the definition. Then he had me look up the word empirical and read that definition. And then in a very patriarchal way, he said that I was too metaphysical and needed to work on being more empirical. But on top of all of that, my favorite toy as a little girl was his typewriter and his glue sticks and his exacto knives and all of that. So uh, I think like to me, the creative studio assistant is like being a librarian. And, 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 and I mean, it's a lot of information flying at me. So I got my spreadsheet on so many times and, um, but the great thing about it too is again, working with Ebony, working in this jazz aesthetic, working in a non-hierarchical way, I don't have to completely suppress or sublimate my creative self. I still showed up fully present. Now, mind you, I always prioritized getting the organization and the work done. I got to miss out on a few really exciting, juicy ritual prompts because I had to do this or that and the other, you know, making sure people had their contracts, making sure people had this and that and the other. But the thing about it is I do that kind of stuff with joy anyway. I, I, I use my, my benign OCD powers for good, not evil. But so I'm doing all of this with joy, you know? Yes, oh my gosh. I left the, the E off of Kristen's middle name. Let me fix that with love, you know? All those little things. Put the comment in the in the document. I'm gonna get to that, you know? So it was a it was a joyful creative rigor for me. And I am so grateful that. I, and then I'm telling you too, another anecdote, I conjured this, right? For a while now, I have wanted to be in a, a deeper dovetail kind of collaboration with Ebony and BDAC. I think we've had a lot of mutual admiration. We just didn't know how to, how to find it. And I, and I felt like I was also still kind of undoing some frustrations and trauma from a recent academic experience working on my master's degree and how violent those institutions are and how how was it that I am my I know to the core I'm a performer I'm a creative but I don't feel like I really fit in the world of theater well all of that has changed y'all y'all better get ready because I, I I have grabbed on to to the hem of the BDAC garment and helped stitch it up as well and so, and, and, I, and I did an affirmation where I said I wanted all of these things next, made it into a video. I'm telling you, a week later is when Ebony called me. So, so just to go back to what Kristen was saying, we weren't just creating, we were conjuring. And I really believe it was because of all of those balances of the empirical and the metaphysical, going in with real rigor and real nerd, like, break. well, what does that word mean? And what is the etymology of it? And like, right, we was geeking out hardcore. And then at the same time, you know, getting our twerk on in the shake array with the music, you know, when we come back from the break, that was overdue because we were so on such a roll. I didn't want to, as a creative studio assistant, say, let's take a break because I didn't want to break the momentum. So there was a lot of intuition in this as well. And I felt like in my own way, I got to be a mother of the process as well, a, a co-nurturer. And it's still going on. I mean, he's still saying to me, yo, put this in the mother document. We don't say master plan, we say mother document. I just I wanna- to, I have to say, I'm sorry, I'm jumping in, Kyria. Here's the thing that I want, if, if people who watch this don't pay attention to anything else, I would love for folks to, especially Folks who, black folks, black femme folks, I want to just speak one for one moment and say,
you want to build you a tribe of folks that understand womanism and black feminism as a technology that you can place anywhere and that is the skill set you need right so it's not like oh we're not being professional because we got to go take a, a rest break oh we're not being professional when we need to take a nap well no the whole aesthetic the whole the whole idea of theater through a black feminist and a womanist lens is that you are cared for. Now, you it is rigorous. You see Dragonfly said rigorous five million times, right? It is rigorous. There, it, there are expectations, but the expectations are not more important than your humanity. And they are in alignment with your humanity. And so this is the thing, you know, the work that we're building is about what is the world, what is a black feminist world rooted in thriving? What, is that, what does that look like when systems of oppression fall away? That's the question that's guiding the whole project. What does a theater look like that's rooted in black feminist aesthetics and womanist aesthetics and just black, black women being free? How about that? Black femmes being free, how about that? We don't even have to give it a whole political aesthetic, right? Just when I'm free, when you see my freedom as integral to the way theater gets made, holler at me. Let's talk, let's build. And that is, that then, you know, you curate people around you. I did a little YouTube video before this saying to people, hey, I know you see Apollo on here and high arts and all of these whoop de whoop you know, muckety mucks. But let me tell you this, if you're not down with black feminism do not apply and it took me several months to put my little my little iphone video together to say what should be obvious by now because this is where i'm coming from but it's hard to say that right because then you get labeled away as really as difficult when you say i don't care what container you come in but are you a black feminist I don't care what container you come in, but do you love black women and femmes? If you don't, there is no reason for you to come over here. We're not paying enough for you to put yourself through that, right? Go where you need to go and let us build our theater, <laughs> our ceremony in a way that doesn't harm us because we can't do both at the same time and wipe your tears away. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. I just want to name, because uh, uh, you said BDAC a couple of times, I want to make sure that the listening audience knows that we're talking about Betty's Daughter Arts Collaborative, which is um, what Ebony founded in 2009. Um, Betty's can... my mama. She's retired, living in Houston, chilling. I was that, I was wondering, I was like, is it Betty Shabbat? Like, who is it? <laughs> it's your mama. I so love it. Dr. Betty Ann Sims, who's a retired youth activist, interventionist, nonprofit worker, professor, uh, teacher. Um, yeah, from Stop Six, which is a neighbor, a historically black neighborhood in Texas and Fort Worth. And before that, from the rural areas surrounding Shreveport, Louisiana. My people are from Louisiana, East Texas, Texas all day, every day, whoop, whoop, you know. Um, but that's the thing, right? It's like in doing, also doing work in my mother's name, talking about in the name of, in the name of the people who make it possible for you to get here. Please don't come over here, you know, putting salt on the sweetness because then we got to be salty and you don't want that. Thank you. I can I jump in to say something too about that, yeah. Ebony? It just, you know, this thing about working through this Black feminist lens makes everything possible. That's something that you taught me. Like everything becomes possible. And I love that we were just talking about your mama because I remember you telling us the story about how your mother would sit down at the kitchen table. She'd write out all of her expenses and then she'd have all the resources to pay for those expenses. And it felt like that's what we were doing all the time. We would sit down, write out what we needed, and then just sit and wait and it would appear. And it's like when we work in this framework, we begin to understand that, that anything is possible. When you really care for people, when you really care for Black women and understand that Black women is the source of it all, it's like anything can happen in that space. I just wish everybody understood that. 
and would stop asking us to like sublimate this part of ourselves and work in these other ways, which of course I know nobody on this call has any interest in, but it's like if everybody could get on, just get on the winning team, you know, we would just, <laughs> the world would be a better place. Art would be better, theater would be better when we understand that, that this is really the root of, of possibility, the, really the source of, of all creation. Yeah, absolutely. I think what you're all speaking to right now is just the notion of getting out of the way of the thing that is already happening, as opposed to creating false barriers, which is such a, a prescient conversation right now. As a theater maker myself, there, there are still folks who on the one breath say, yes, I want to support more Black arts, more women, da da, and then, but, 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 and really those buts are uh, often very much false barriers that are about a sh uh, an inability to imagine shifting, just letting go of what has been and letting something else happen. I think, can't say that enough. I wanna, we, we're when getting- have we failed? When have we failed? When have we failed? Hmm. When, we, when we were, when we have what we need and those, and those you know, tools, this is why I want to say this. I know, Kiri, I know you got your list. I know you got your list. But this is I why mean, I, in, the, in, our, in part one of this conversation, y'all, you, you know, anybody who watches part one and part two will notice, well, first, I have done a costume change. But two, you'll notice that the way that I listen to Alexis, right? Kiri, you, you, I mean, it's a different conversation here on purpose. Alexis, like I said, Alexis is my teacher. So whenever I'm in Alexis's presence, I'm doing what? Listening. I don't care what Alexis has to say. I don't care because I, Alexis is my teacher. And how do I know that I'm learning from one? I mean, she's one of my teachers, but how do I know I'm learning by this conversation, right? Because I can't do what I don't know. I can't do what I haven't been taught. And this is not like, again, like you, we, we pointed to in the last conversation, this is not, Alexis, we've been in this. I've been reading zines and 511 blogs and all of that. But because Alexis does her work, I can do my work. I'm very clear that if I want to do my work better, I need to listen to the person, to the, to the person who's bringing forth the, the, the cosmologies of information that have never failed us, no matter where you place them. And that is the thing, right? You, people may be scared because they've been let down by their systems, but our systems don't fail us, never have. And that's the thing, you know, that's rumbling in my, in, in my gut. That's the thing that's firing up my, 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 uh, my my will right now is I got teachers, y'all, and they have expectations about how their work is activated. And you can tell when people don't have anybody to be accountable to. You can tell when you don't have teachers. You can tell when you somebody's smart, but they don't have someone that's like, nah, boo boo. That's not quite it. You can tell. And you and I want teachers. I want people. I, and, and Alexis is younger than me. I want to just be clear to the people who watch this. I put, a, I put a post on Facebook the other day that said, thank you for my elders who are younger than me. And this is the thing that we gotta just get out of this, out of this because we're gonna run these bad systems and strategies so much that we won't be able to come back from that, but our systems have never failed us, yes. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm I'm trying to get a, a time check because there are 70, 11 questions I could ask you all and I don't want to open up a can of worms that we can't finish. Some things that are on my mind, you know, I just want to briefly name, I don't know that we have time to go into all the things this could mean, but I think it's interesting in your piece in the name of Ebony, we know that Harlem is an incredibly important place, an incredibly important site. It will be where the ceremony, um, the performative ceremony ultimately happens. And also you had collaborators from Ghana and Texas and other places um, joining in on this process. So there's there's a way in which I'm I'm curious about um, 
the virtual process allowing a different kind of diasporic collaboration than we've seen in a long time, um, so on and so forth. Another thread we could follow, you know, Dragonfly, you told us to watch out and I'm excited about what, what was going to happen next. I'm curious about how each of you might be thinking about activating virtual making separately from in the name of for you, Kristen and Dragonfly. Those are curiosities I have. Let me just see what our time check is, see if I can actually let y'all answer any of these questions. Well, we got 10 minutes. So uh, <laughs> does I'll, that I'll jump in, uh, because I am I am deep in the throes of resuming a project that I you know, tabled when the pandemic started. And because the pandemic started, thought I wouldn't be able to resume it. Uh, but now, actually, shortly after this conversation, I'm having my second production meeting, which includes a friend from Texas, uh, someone in California, uh, someone who is upstate, and so on. And also, another thing that I have done, um, learning how to, it's, it's interesting how we got our time back because of the pandemic, but at the same time realizing that much more how little time we have. So this week has been an unprecedented week for me in terms of scheduling and busyness because I'm able to actually show up to so many places, including this conversation without walking out that door and having to put on a mask. I put on my eyebrows, but I didn't have to put on a mask, you know? And, and, and realizing just how much you can get done before you have to physically be in person. And going back to me being, you know, that, you know, sexy Afropunk librarian mentality, I have used tools that have always been available to us but to a whole other level. Automate as much of the creative and logistical process as possible so that you have even more capacity for the actual creative stuff. That empirical side of it, get your Google Calendar popping, learn how to use Google Sheets, don't be using Microsoft Word and email and files back and forth, that's so 1996, you know? All of that. Learn how to use your phone. Learn how to make them videos. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's process. It's art. We have so much capacity to make art in the digital form. And we really, I think, didn't know how to take advantage of it until we were forced to sit our behinds down and take advantage of it. And finally, one last thing, another thing I've done, I miss going to coffee shops so much. That was my thing, y'all. Going to the coffee shop, bring the laptop, knowing I can make coffee at home. But you know, you get to if you bored, hey, hey, what you working on? What you reading? And now, now you got new friends, right? Can't do that. But now, what I do is I schedule these two-hour virtual co-working sessions with a variety of people. They may be somebody that I'm not even collaborating on anything with. But it, it, it's, it's, there's that fine line between solitude and isolation. And so in order to keep it from being isolation, there's a way that you can work in community while in solitude. So let's be busy together. And, it's, it's, and I even borrowed that structure from the way that Ebony has, has facilitated and coordinated our development sessions. We get into the room. We key, 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 key. Okay, now what we let's 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 center with some breath. No, before we center with the breath, we set our intentions. Well, this is what I need to accomplish. This is what you need to accomplish. So we're like silent witnesses with our Zoom or Google Meet or whatever technology we're using, open, maybe music playing, but it's like being in the coffee shop. And I got the timer set up every 25 minutes, take a booty break. Cause if you sit on your booty too long, you're gonna get them varicose veins and sciatica and all of that. So don't do that. Cause ain't nobody got time to go to physical therapy because you in lockdown. Get up, do your booty break. At the end, we check in. This is what I done. They have, I swear to God, I have gotten so much work done 
in those virtual co-working sessions than when I'm autonomous. Because when I'm autonomous, I'm playing with the kitten and I'm, maybe I should fold these clothes. So there's a certain amount of accountability that you get with this community making in a digital space so that when you do physically come together, then you can really suck the marrow out of that. And that, with that, I'm good. Thank you. I'm walking away with booty break and putting that on the on the <laughs> on the daily reminders. Um, Kristen, is there anything you want to say briefly about collaborating from? What you doing, Kristen? What you doing? Oh, well, I'm doing all kinds of stuff, but I want to talk about what I learned from this process that I'm taking right. forward into all that other stuff, and that is that you can create a ritual container anywhere, even on a Google Meet. And Ebony, you did that with us and for us. Oh, I mean, it's just that part blows me away. And so everything that I've done since or have been doing during this process, you've really influenced um, my thinking and my practice around how do we really set intention like Dragonfly was talking about? How do we really like create a container for people of like this, this is what we're doing. And even with something as simple as like being really intentional about how we check in with folks and understanding that that is not uh apart from the work that that is the work you know like my people also from east texas from the country and sometimes just the question of how are you that's the whole conversation who your people where who your people from you know that can be a job interview just that question right there so like that can be the work itself so you you reminded me of that of how even though we're apart we're clear across the world that we can still create um, a bubble and we have to like put a sacred bubble around the work. So um, while we were in process, I was also curating a series of conversations in Memphis with Claiborne Temple. I've been in process with Jenny Coons and Jillian Walker working on a new piece with them. And then coming forward, I, I'm, I'm honored to share that I'm one of the new I Am Soul playwriting residents at MBT um, for 2020-2021. So, and everything that I've learned here, I will take into all those spaces when we think about ritual and creating from a black feminist lens. I mean, this experience is leaving a, a beautiful imprint on everything that I'm, that I'm making. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, for those who don't know, NBT is National Black Theater. Uh, which is also located in Harlem, uh, founded by Dr. Barbara Antier. Um, and so I want to um, uh, take us to a little bit of a, a wrap up and close, remind us a little bit of where we've been. I mean, one of the biggest takeaways for me is that um, a reminder, honestly, but also um, a reassertion and a reimagining that um, Black feminist process in the arts and otherwise is not necessarily about location. I mean, it is about being aware of location, but not about the container, such as whether we're in the studio or on um, the Google Meet, but about our intention towards that, about that allowance of caretaking for one another, joy, uh, you said joyful, creative rigor, Dragonfly, I really love that. Um, and that, that, that intention and that uh, attention to the sort of wholeness of ourselves in the work allows us to be bountiful even when we're not able to leave our homes and our home becomes the cafe the studio and not in a oh it's it has to be all the things but it can be all the things there's so much bounty and opportunity um and i thank you all for for living that so um uh, boldly and allowing us to witness a part of that um any literally last words uh we have like a minute left anything else that, yeah go ahead Dragonfly. i forgot to mention what the project is that i'm working on um so i talk about black feminism the project is called absconded i am going to be a living statue bronze statue of ona judge who was enslaved by George and Martha Washington. This will be an iterative project to interact with and challenge as many landmarks, monuments, and the whole mythological legacy of who George and Martha really were. Ona was also, I think, the opposite of Harriet Tubman. And so we need to look at the whole full spectrum of what slavery was and is because if she was considered the most privileged of what a slave could be and she still walked out let's talk about that 
Okay, let's talk about that. Thank you. Right on time. Um, uh, Kristen, any last yes. sort of? Yeah. Dragonfly, I love that you're doing that. I have her book right here, Never Caught, about on a judge. It's sitting, my iPad is sitting on top of it. Um, but what I have coming up is actually a play of mine called The Oldest Town in Texas is being produced by Bold, an all-women's Black theater producing entity. And they are doing a reading of that, a digital reading directed by Bianca Laverne Jones on the 28th. So I'm not sure when this will be shared, but if it's before that, people can tune in um, on the 28th through Bold's platform. 28th of August or September? Of August, of August. Okay. This will yeah. probably air after that, but hopefully people can check out what comes next after that. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Ebony, last thoughts? Yeah, um, what's next for me is going to the ocean, um, which happens in 20 hours. Um, and then um, this fall in terms of in the name of, I'll be, I'm ready to make music. So in September, I'll be thinking about what does it mean to be in a virtual music sonic, you know, composing practice. And then I will bring the people together virtually. And, you know, musicians know how to send tracks back and forth. I'm, I'll, I will be learning, but I'm looking forward to that in terms of the next steps for this piece, writing and music. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, well, I want to thank everyone um, so much uh, for this exciting conversation. I feel kind of effervescent and ready to write after this. Um, I want to thank our interpreter, uh, Brandon Kazen uh, Maddox again. Um, I want to thank High Arts and I want to thank, um, I want to thank the water. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you everyone and uh, we'll look forward to more from our wonderful panelists.